Hello and welcome to the first lecture in English 3 with me, Dr. Matt Barton. In this lecture, we'll be covering the first chapter of the book, uh, Succeeding in Business Communication. And you can see there we have, let's see, what, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine uh, topics that we need to get to today. So let's <laughs> jump right into this. The objectives for today, uh, first, to understand the benefits of good communication. Uh, two, to understand why students need to be able to communicate well, the costs of communication, the costs of poor communication, some criteria for effective messages, the role conventions play in business communication, and finally, how to solve business communication problems. First of all, what are the forms of communication we'll be covering in this course. These authors basically give us uh, two very basic types. And when I just say the word communication, what pops into your head? I'm guessing it's going to be one of the first types, a verbal form of communication, something involving language. So it could be speaking or it could be writing. And you can see here they've got some uh, examples here, a phone conversation, an informal meeting, a presentation, like this one, uh, tweets, email, you get the idea. It's something that involves words. Now, the other type is nonverbal, and this is anything from a picture, a graphic. I think these are interesting, a company logo. Uh, so when you look at a logo like McDonald's Golden Arch, uh, you, could think, you could ask yourself, what does that logo communicate? Does it seem kind of like a friendly logo? Does it make you hungry for some french fries maybe? Uh, versus a very serious logo. Uh, but they've also got here some nice things like a smile. You know, everybody <laughs> uh, seems to like you better if you smile a lot uh, versus if you have a scowl on your face. I mean, that certainly communicates. Uh, and also some interesting items like the size of an office, the location of people, where you sit at a meeting. You know, all these things can communicate things. And sometimes uh, you might not even really be thinking too much about what you are communicating. Uh, I like to use the example here with this last one, location of people at meetings. You know, what does it communicate to your professor if on the first day of class, uh, instead of, let's just take two students, and let's say the first student goes to the very front of the class and sits in the front row, and then another student comes in and sits at the very back, you know, as far back as that student can get. You know, what, what is being communicated there? So <laughs> you can probably imagine, uh, but it's a good example of something you, you might not even be aware of. Now, probably the biggest reason that we want you to be able to communicate well is that you'll be uh, promoted more. Good communicators earn more money. I would say, uh, you know, it starts with the good communicators get the job, right? If you're, if you got a great resume, if you do a great job at your at the job interview, uh, you're more likely to get the job. You know, you might have all kinds of qualifications and skills and be a hard worker and all of that good stuff, but if that doesn't come across, uh, you might not get the job. Same thing with when you're up for promotion. If somebody else, if one of your coworkers is a better communicator, uh, they might get more of the credit uh, than you will, even though you did more of the work. So uh, it really helps to have good communication skills. And this also works on the, from the other side of the desk. If you've managed people or if you've had managers, some good, some bad, uh, you'll know that sometimes it's really hard to know how to please a manager. Right? Like, what, is, what does this manager want? <laughs> Why is the manager mad at me? Uh, or what, is, what am I supposed to be doing? I, I don't know how to do that. Uh, so that's all, be all examples of uh, poor communication for management. Uh, whereas, of course, if, you, if you've had the pleasure of working with a good manager, all these problems just kind of go away and it's, it's really clear what the expectations are. And uh, people enjoy those managers, so of course they get uh, promoted more too. They get more work done. Uh, the purposes of communication, uh, these authors break it down into three basic ones, and these go all the way back, uh, by the way, to uh, Quint Quintilian, ancient Greek uh, orator, and teacher. So wh why would you communicate in a business setting? Uh, first of all, probably uh, more than likely the purpose of that communication is to inform or to explain something. 
you know, think about how, how often at a workplace uh, you're asked, you know, how does uh, how does this work, or what is this? What are the features of this pro uh, product? How do I uh, uh, go back? <laughs> how do I restart the video? You know, all of those sorts of uh, situations fall under this first category of informing. Uh, the second one, to request or persuade, urge some kind of action. You could think about a, any, basically any type of sales or marketing situation. And then lastly, the build goodwill, make a good image. Uh, companies are very concerned about their branding, their reputation. Uh, they want people, when they think about the company, uh, to have a good impression of that company. All right, that's very important. And these authors also point out that the most of the time, your document or your communication will be some blend of these three. And I can use the example here of a resume. So if you write a, a resume, the first part of the main job of that resume is to inform uh, the employer, what are your qualifications? Where'd you go to school? Where are you from? What kind of ex job experience do you have? That's just the first one, informational. But it also does the second one. It uh, requests, you're requesting a job interview. And you're also persuading, you're persuading them that you're qualified for the job and that you're the best candidate. And then finally, it also does the third one, building goodwill, making a good image. You know, if, you, if you've done your due diligence and proofread it and there's, it doesn't have any errors on there and, it, and your letter, you come across as a friendly uh, person uh, that, that wants the company to do well. You're not just thinking about yourself, but you know how you can improve that company. Uh, that will all go towards this last one, building goodwill. Now there's two basic types of audiences. So we've talked about the purposes. Now we're talking about the audience or who is on the other end of your communication. And they, again, go with two basic categories, internal or inside the company and external, which it would be outside the company. So some examples of internals would be a subordinate. So if you're a manager, the people that work for you, under you, uh, the superiors, this could be your manager all the way up to the CEO uh, or peers or coworkers, right? These are people within that organization. And then external, just everything else, right? Customers, uh, the uh, suppliers of the products, the distributors. Now let's talk about poor communication. So a lot of employers complain about this. They say they're, uh, they're, they're constantly having to deal with uh, poorly written emails either within or without the outside the company. Uh, there's all kinds of uh, horrible things that can happen. Uh, let's consider a few of these. Now, the, the main cost is simply wasting time, right? So if you get an email from your manager or you as a manager send a, a poorly written email to someone else, then uh, they might have to call you and say, look, I, I don't understand what, you're, what you mean in this email. Can you explain that to me? Uh, or uh, maybe you give somebody the wrong information and they do it wrong and then they have to redo it. Uh, stuff like this happens all the time. It's just a big waste of time. And of course, a uh, wasted effort. You know, this really kind of ties into the first one, right? If you uh, do, do something wrong because the instructions were wrong, uh, then you just wasted a whole lot of effort and time. Uh, losing goodwill. <laughs> You know, I don't know if, if you're like me, but if you've ever tried to put some furniture together that you ordered online or you, you got it in a big box <laughs> and you're sitting there trying to put it together and the instructions are confusing, uh, that can really make you start to question uh, that company, right? You think, I'll never buy another product from this company again. Uh, so you definitely can lose goodwill. Uh, creating legal problems, you know, we've seen plenty of that. I won't go into it here, but if you uh, look at the news, you know, it's, it's very common that these uh, people in positions of power, people that really ought to know better, uh, they send out these tweets or uh, emails, and they, you know, I guess they think that nobody's, you know, that nobody will ever read that email, <laughs> or that it won't ever come back to haunt them. Uh, so that's that's one problem, but. Again, thinking about instructions, you know, if you have uh, instructions that are confusing and somebody gets injured, uh, that can result in a suit. You can actually get sued over something like that. So all kinds of legal 
issues to consider. And they give some a little box here, some ways to lose goodwill. Use improper courtesy titles. So this doesn't bother me. I'm a pretty laid back guy, as you could probably tell. So somebody calls me Dr. Barton, I'm fine with that. If somebody calls me Mr. Barton, I'm fine with that. They could even call me Matt. <laughs> I'm pretty laid back. Uh, but uh, other people would get really upset by this. You know, they, I've heard uh, colleagues, my colleagues, uh, some of them really get upset when a student calls them Mr. or Miss, and, and they'll say something like, well, call me, you should call me doctor, because I, I put a lot of work into this, earning this doctorate, and it's disrespectful to ignore it. Uh, so again, I always err on the side of being overly formal than risking offending somebody by being too informal. So I would suggest you do the same. Uh, let's see what else they have here. Employing bureaucratic language. Uh, nobody likes that, uh, you know, the legalese or the real formal, stiff language. Uh, when somebody's asking a simple question and they keep you keep responding in this almost robotic fashion, uh, nobody really likes that. Uh, conveying a selfish tone. <laughs> well, clearly, it's not hard to see how that would cost you some goodwill. Uh, they want you to help them, uh, not worry about yourself. And bearing the main point, making a vague request, I think all of the, all this ties into the sixth one, misusing words and misspelling words. Uh, bearing the main point, making vague, vague requests, or even just a misspelled word, all of that stuff uh, can make people question uh, first of all, that you put the time into writing that document or making that speech, uh, but also maybe you've got something to hide or you're just not really very educated, right? If, if you're, especially with number six, if you've got lots of misspelled words, uh, that looks like uh, you, you didn't really get, do very well in school, right? So uh, that's, a, that would be pretty disastrous. All right, so what do we mean by effective message? Uh, how do we get beyond just saying, well, that's a good message, uh, that's a bad message? How can we be clear about our criteria or the standards of judgment? Probably the first and most important one is, is it clear? So if I send you an email with uh, instructions about how to write a proposal and you read those instructions, understand them, know exactly what it is you're supposed to do, you'd say that's very clear. On the other hand, if there's a bunch of points and you're scratching your head and you're having to reread a passage over and over because it just doesn't make any sense, obviously that violates clarity. Right along with that, complete. Do you have all the information there or do you have to keep emailing or calling and saying, look, uh, you forgot to put uh, how many words it needs to be or you didn't uh, specify what needs to be in the uh, you know, uh, marketing section or whatever it is. Third, is it correct? Right, this is, uh, you know, I'd probably put this at least up there with uh, clarity. Uh, you know, it doesn't really matter how clear it is if you're giving incorrect information. I mean, it's probably <laughs> probably even worse if that's clear. So have you even fact-checked this? Have you verified it? Saving the audience's time, another big plus. If uh, a lot of these textbooks have uh, like the chapter objectives, uh, table of contents with lots of little subsections in there so that you can just skip a section if you already know it, move on to the next. I would also put being wordy in this category. So if you can say if you could say it in 10 minutes, then why are you taking half an hour to say it? And then again, back to this idea of building goodwill. Uh, does the document you know, make you feel better about the company? Does it have a friendly vibe to it, helpful vibe? Or does it seem somehow menacing or nasty? So we're going to talk here more about goodwill and positive images. A goodwill message. So as a professor, I'm always thinking about the image, uh, not just of myself, but uh, St. Cloud State. You know, if I send an email to a student and it's it's, I'm kind of maybe I'm really mad at the student and that really comes across. <laughs> uh, it it might get my anger across clearly, but you, you could ask yourself, is it really achieving the goal uh, that I'm, I'm setting out there? Maybe I want the student to work harder, uh, spend more time editing, revising. 
uh, or whatever it is. But if I seem like I'm just being mean or some or rude or anything like that, it will not, not only will it actually make me look bad, uh, but it could actually reflect on the university as a whole. So you could imagine this anytime you're being, uh, you're not being uh, polite, respectful. It's not just necessarily your reputation on the line, but that whole reputation. And I like this point here too about treating the audience as a person, not a number. You know, nobody likes this. Uh, just being, uh, you know, not taking not taken seriously as a as a person. <laughs> and you, you've probably been in the situation before where they they didn't even care what your name was. You just it's kind of a generic customer or, or person, and they, they don't even really care to get to know you. Uh, so this all can. Uh, come back to this idea of goodwill. You know, you think about a really good manager, uh, something I've noticed about the managers I've worked with is that they, they really take the time to get, not, not just to know your name and a little bit about you, but they'll even know something about your family. You know, if you have kids, they'll know the name of your kids or your pets, and they'll ask you about, you know, how's your, you know, how's Fido? <laughs> just kind of shows that they, they, you know, they cared enough to, to know a little bit about you and that, makes you feel better towards that person, right? Uh, cementing good relationship between the audience and the communicator. All right, so let's uh, move into conventions here. Uh, so sometimes the students aren't clear on what, what is meant by business conventions. Uh, I will break it down probably a little differently over uh, than they, these authors do. Uh, I think of, of a convention as basically just a tradition uh, it could be something like you wear, if, if it's a job interview, you probably want to wear a shirt and tie uh, if you're a guy or uh, formal attire, right? You probably want to wear nice uh, formal dressy shoes, uh, not, not sneakers. Uh, so those are kind of conventions. You know, there's no real logical reason why it has to be that way. It's just kind of the way it evolved. And same thing with the layout of a resume uh, or if you're writing an essay for one of your classes, usually those are double spaced. It's just a convention. It doesn't really matter anymore, right? We're on computers. If you send me a single spaced document, I can just hit a button and make it double spaced. But that's neither here nor there. The important thing is there's a convention, a tradition that that should be double spaced. And if you violate that, it can make you look bad. Uh, so let's look at how they define it then. They, they say it's a widely accepted practice you routinely encounter. Uh, so one of the conventions they talked about in the book is that uh, of casual Fridays, right? Or, or some businesses now, they're moving away from this idea of uh, shirts and ties and suits uh, and just being more casual. It's okay to wear jeans and shorts. Uh, there's, there's kind of a change in the convention. So that kind of brings us into that second point there too, right? The organizational setting. Now it could be that that same job that you're wearing shorts and sandals to, maybe if they have a retreat, uh, they might expect you to dress differently at that retreat, right? Uh, changing over time, uh, this is another a big one. You know, think about all the uh, conventions that have changed, even maybe the past 10, 20, 30 years. Uh, if you watch that show of Mad Men on, uh, what is that? Uh, you know, kind of blanking on the network that that airs on, but if you, it's basically 1950s, 1960s uh, advertising agency. And it's just amazing. I mean, these guys are smoking and drinking and <laughs> just doing things in their workplace that seem like just bizarre to us. I mean, that never, you can never get away with any of that stuff today. Uh, but on the other hand, on the other hand, some of the things they do seem a lot more formal and rigid. So it's kind of been a, a two-way street there, but that's that's a good example. Now, helping people to recognize, produce, and interpret communications. Uh, this is, again, one of the reasons why we have these conventions. Uh, you know, imagine this, if every time there was a job interview, if you just had no idea, like, what am I supposed to wear? Should I go formal? Should I go informal? Should I wear sneakers? Should I wear a cowboy hat? And you know, what if, if there were no conventions in place and it would just be random? And that would probably be pretty uh, frustrating, right? They're just, there's nothing there, no tradition, no, no uh, expectation. Uh, that would be really hard. Uh, 
we kind of like these conventions, really. Same thing with a resume. It's, it's kind of nice when somebody can say, look, uh, it's you're supposed to have a section called job history and a section called uh, volunteer activities or, or whatever it is. Uh, once you know those conventions, it's a lot easier to write that document than if you have just no idea how to even get started on it. Let's see, what's the last one here? Need to fit rhetorical situation, audience, context, and purpose. Uh, so one of the examples they give, uh, not this book, but uh, most classes like this will give, is if you're writing a letter to uh, your principal or your friend <laughs> or your parent, maybe it's the same topic, but in each uh, different context, purpose, and audience, the letter will be radically different. All right, so let's analyze a situation. They say that to analyze situations, you should ask questions. So let's say that, let's take the example of this resume. So if we're gonna write a resume, so the first question we should ask is, what's at stake and to whom? Well, what's the situation here? We are writing a resume because we're looking for a job. So what's at stake? Well, whether you get the job or not. Uh, second one, should you send a message? Well, we could ask ourselves this. Uh, you might say, well, there's I shouldn't send this message because uh, <laughs> you know, I'm not qualified for the job. Or you should say, I should definitely send this because I, I need to get this sent in and make sure I'm in the, in the pool. Uh, what channel should you use? Well, this is, a, this is a very relevant with resumes too because a lot of companies now, they don't even take print resumes. Uh, they everything's online so maybe that means uh, you need to send this in the form of an email or maybe there's a web form you need to fill out maybe they want a pdf document uh, who knows right but that's definitely something you should figure out <laughs> what should you say that's pretty uh, obvious right you need to tell them uh, about your job history your education your training and so on uh, how should you say it probably want to go formal, right? And be uh, very professional in that form, in that resume. Okay, so hopefully you saw how that worked. You would just apply those, ask those same questions depending on whatever the document was. All right, so common solving business communication problems. Uh, first, to gather knowledge. So one of the problems uh, you know, I've been struggling uh, this semester so far with the D2L. I'm um, trying to learn how to use D2L. It's been a while since I've worked with it. And I want to be able to communicate to you, right? I want you to know what are the due dates uh, for the various assignments we'll be doing in the class. So the first thing I need to do is gather some knowledge. You know, see if I, can I find some tutorials online about uh, how to use the calendar on D2L? Is there some help pages available? Is there a person I can call and talk to, but I just start off by gathering the knowledge. And the second one, we'll get more into this one later, but the five analysis questions, and again, we'll get to that one later, so I'll just save it. Uh, brainstorming solutions. Uh, <laughs> not really sure how this, I don't think this would apply so well to my example about D2L, uh, but we could certainly get together a group and say, well, you know, maybe you shouldn't even use the calendar. Maybe you should just email a list uh, with all those due dates on it. Or maybe you should uh, make up a little calendar in uh, Word or Excel or whatever it is and, and send that to them. So we, we could come up with lots of possibilities. Or And then uh, organizing information to fit. So we got their audiences, purposes, and context. So... I think this, maybe I picked a kind of simple example, really, with this, this idea of uh, the calendar of assignments, because <laughs> you're the audience, that's pretty clear. Uh, the purpose uh, is going to be um, so you can look ahead and see what, when these assignments are coming up due, and so you can uh, adequately plan for it, right? And of course, the context being the, the class, and you want to get a good grade in the class. Uh, so I could certainly organize all this with, th with those purposes and you as an audience in mind. Uh, obviously, I don't want to come across as, as some kind of jerk. Uh, I don't want to come across in a condescending fashion. Uh, I want to come across as, as helpful to you and, and try to get you uh, 
you know, these, I want to try to make it really clear to you when the due dates are so that you uh, can achieve your purpose of making a good grade in the class. And again, the, coming back to the idea of the context, keeping in mind we only have this one semester. Uh, I don't know how many classes like this you've had. I don't even know if you've worked with D2L before. Um, so hopefully all this is, you're starting to get a little behind the scenes look, I guess, at sort of what goes on in a professor's head as, I, <laughs> as he's planning all this stuff. Now, making the document visually inviting. You know, this is one that I think a lot about, believe it or not. I, I like the look of this PowerPoint. <laughs> you know, the little picture there with the, the lady kind of looking up. Uh, you know, I, I think that picture makes the image more interesting, or makes this slide more interesting than if it was just text and no image. And I kind of like the color scheme here. Now, I didn't create this document myself, but I would I think it definitely looks a lot more visually inviting uh, than just a boring you know, list uh, that you see on most PowerPoints. Okay, let's see, revising the draft for tone. Uh, so as I was kind of talking about this earlier, right? But this, this need to come across as friendly, business-like, positive. You know, obviously a professor, it's not quite the same as, a, you know, being a manager at a business, but I think all this stuff basically applies we all like professors that are friendly to us. <laughs> you tend to want to do a good job in, in a class when you, you feel like the professor has goodwill towards you, right? Uh, Business-like, you know, it would be kind of weird if the if your manager or supervisor was, uh, I don't know, uh, just, just acting really goofy and, and strange. Uh, you might think that <laughs> maybe the professor's having a really bad day and just kind of snapping at you. Uh, you know, it wouldn't be very businesslike, wouldn't be very professional. And again, would kind of come back and negative, make a negative impression, not only of that professor, but the whole institution. Uh, being positive, you know, this, this last one I, I notice sometimes, even in, uh, when I'm working with students on their resumes and their, and their uh, application letters and things, and I'll say, you, you know, you really want to sound positive at all times. And one of the problems we'll get into uh, is, you know, maybe the student worked at a, a job and they just really hated the job. They hated the manager. Uh, they just couldn't wait to get out of there. And that comes across in their documents. So it's, it's clear that this person really hated their former employer. And I always say you shouldn't put that in there. You know, if you you can not say anything about it or try to minimize it, but you definitely shouldn't sound like you're angry or that you're hostile uh, because it just, you know, if you're negative about that employer, the, the new one might think, well, this person is going to be saying the same thing about me a few months on down the road. Uh, so I just say, <laughs> it was the way my grandmother would put it, uh, if you can't say something nice, uh, don't say anything at all. You know, that, that seems to have worked out pretty well for her and uh, <laughs> for me in life. I try to avoid uh, dwelling on negative points, especially when I'm communicating to, to you uh, as, as your professor, and I would imagine that you would appreciate that. Let's see what we have here. Edit draft for standard English uh, names and numbers. I'm not, I'm not honestly quite sure what, what do they mean there. <laughs> uh, so I guess uh, names, names are tricky because they, the spelling can be tough. It's nothing really worse than getting a, an email, right, or a letter, or, or even somebody calling you by the wrong name. Uh, so it's probably worth checking that twice. And numbers, I guess they've got that highlighted there just because in a business situation, the, you know, if you miss a zero, you say it's $150 instead of $1,500. Uh, that's a pretty big deal. Uh, so maybe it is worth double checking those. Using the response to plan future messages, uh, the real key here is, let's say you emailed me and you, you were very formal. You said, dear Professor Barton, uh, blah, 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 just was really formal in that letter or that email, even had sincerely had your name on it and everything was very businesslike and formal. But then I wrote back to you and I said, let's say your name is uh, Tom, right? I said, well, hey, you know, <laughs> what's up, Tom? Uh, got your email. You can swing by tomorrow. We'll talk about the project. See ya. 
<laughs> you know, if I was very informal back to you, then next time you wrote, you could be, you could, you would probably want to match that tone, right? It'd be a little weird uh, if I'm being really informal. If you keep coming back with this really formal uh, tone, it would just seem a little bit strange. And so the idea there is you kind of match uh, whatever it is you get back. If you know, same thing in a job interview, you start off really formal. And then maybe the person says, you know what, just just call me. You can call me Sarah. You don't have to call me uh, Ms. whatever. Well, then you'd want to go with that and not insist on being formal. All right, let's see. Gathering the knowledge. <laughs> what are the facts? <laughs> oh, man, this one seems to come up a lot these days, doesn't it? Uh, let's say that. Again, coming back to this idea of the uh, the resume, uh, what are the facts? Well, you know, where where have you where did you go to school? Uh, what was your GPA? What did you take any classes that were relevant to the to the uh, job? Um, what kind of work experience have you had? What what did you do with those different jobs? Uh, so those are all good good things to know. And, uh, you might know them, but you might not remember them just right off the top of your head. You might need to make a list so that you can refer back to it when you're working on your document. Uh, two, what can you infer from the information given? So this would be a really good question to ask when you're looking over, when you've finished with your resume. Uh, you can look over that and say, what can you infer from the information given? Uh, I'll give you a hint, uh, hopefully, that you're qualified for the job. Uh, otherwise, you might want to go back in and look at it. And again, uh, that example before where the person was talking bad about their former employer and saying blame, maybe they had horrible coworkers and that the collaboration was terrible and, and management was <laughs> from hell. <laughs> well, what can we infer from this? Maybe that you're the problem. Uh, so that might not be what you want to uh, them to infer. So I, I like that. I, li I love that second one there. Let's see, three, what additional information might be helpful? Well, this is, again, great stuff to be thinking about in terms of your resume. Maybe after you've written this, you, you start thinking, uh, you know what? I was in that club. Uh, I was in that accounting club, and we went to, some, we went to hear some uh, accountants talk about their jobs, or <laughs> I did an internship, uh, whatever it is. You know, maybe I should put that in. Uh, where could you get it? <laughs> where could you get it? I guess this is talking about the uh, additional information. Uh, I would think, uh, talk, just thinking about gathering knowledge and resumes, and resumes again, one of the places you could go to get knowledge is the right place. And that's here in Building 51. It's a, it's a students, it's a student tutors, they're called uh, consultants. Uh, and they're really good at helping uh, other students work on their documents. And they might know things about resumes that could really help you out. Uh, what emotional complexities are involved? Now, that's an interesting one. Uh, let's see. So thinking about a resume, I guess one of the complexities of that would be is nervousness, maybe a little anxious that they won't like you, or won't think you're qualified, or maybe you're a little bit desperate for the job even. Uh, maybe you lack confidence. You know, all of these, I can imagine all of this stuff having, being involved. All right, so five analysis questions then. Who are your audiences? What are their characteristics and how do they differ? So this one here is just vital, vital again for the resume. Uh, the more you know about the company, the more you know about the person that's interviewing you, uh, the more advantages you have in that, that situation, right? If, if you know a little bit about how they like to interview people, um, if you know a little bit about the uh, background of that company, uh, all of that stuff would be, would be great to know. Uh, even things like talking about the person, that particular person, is that person like a more formal style? Uh, do they expect you, uh, uh, to address them in a certain way. You know, all that stuff would come into play there. Uh, how do audiences differ? Well, we could think about the, you know, if you're interviewing for a job uh, as a uh, 
as an intern at a radio station, <laughs> that's probably a much different audience than if you were interviewing for a job at a bank. I'll leave it for you to think about the differences. Uh, what are your purposes? Uh, what must the message do? Uh, so believe it or not, a lot of students get confused about this one in terms of their resume. And I'll say, well, what is the purpose of a resume? And they'll say, well, uh, it's, and then they kind of just kind of freeze up. They haven't really thought about it. They say, well, I guess it's to, uh, you know, talk about me. But really, that's not really the purpose of it, right? It's, it's really... Uh, to get you an interview. I mean, what, what you really want to happen is to, for the person to read your resume and, and pick up the phone and call you and ask you to come in for an interview. That's really the purpose. So that's what the message must do. Uh, what must the audience know, think, or do? You know, believe it or not, I've actually seen resumes from students uh, where they uh, didn't even put the way to contact them. So they say, please call me uh, to set up an interview, but they don't ever put the phone number. <laughs> you know, so that that's a pretty big omission, wouldn't you say? Now, just I'll just say this uh, while I'm thinking about it. Uh, if you for this class, since there'll be other students looking at your stuff, if you don't want to put your real phone number down, uh, that's that's fine. It's not important. You could just put down five 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 for your number. I don't really care. Uh, I just want to make sure that you remember that you should put a phone number on there. Which kind of brings us nicely into this one, right? What information must you include? <laughs> uh, list all the required points. Yeah, you, how to get in touch with you. Uh, where'd you work? Where'd you go to school? Uh, De-emphasize or emphasize properly. So you know with a resume or a job letter, uh, there's ways to bring stuff to the fore and there's ways to kind of uh, bring stuff down, kind of bury it somewhere. Yeah, they say so. To de-emphasize, bury it in a message. Uh, you probably don't. You probably won't have that situation arise at this point. But you could imagine if you work someplace and you didn't do too well, or you know, you're, you're part of some catastrophe at a particular job site. Yeah, you probably wouldn't want to make that front and center if you could help it. You'd probably want to put that somewhere on page three. Um, you certainly, you know, write, speak concisely. You probably wouldn't want to go on and on and on about the bad stuff. You want to get that, you know, if you have to talk about it, fine, but don't keep on talking about it. Try to move on as quickly as you can. Uh, emphasizing it, placing it first or last. And this is the reason why on the resume, I always say, put your school first. You know, you just got your degree. That should be at the very top because that's really good. You know, that's what you want to emphasize, right? I just got a college degree uh, from St. Cloud State. Uh, that's going to be really impressive. Uh, you, you don't want to bury that somewhere deep down in the, on the bottom of the resume somewhere and at the top have, a, you know, the burger joint you worked at. <laughs> you know, no, no offense to the burger joint, I guess, but uh, you can see there how you're not really emphasizing what's important. Uh, let's see, add descriptive details. You know, this this. It's always great. Uh, you know, every now and then I'll have a student that uh, maybe they're on the hockey team or maybe they are uh, part of the uh, the military. And they'll just casually mention this. There'll be like one small bullet point somewhere and they say, was, was captain of the team <laughs> or was was uh, was part of the Navy or, or whatever it is. But they don't really tell you anything about what it is they did. Now, maybe they're trying to de-emphasize it for good reason, but it's probably just they haven't really thought about how impressive something like that is and one way to make it to emphasize it of course is just to kind of go into more details about about that maybe have a whole paragraph about it in your job letter or at the very least you know have two or three points related to it all right moving on then uh, i think we should be almost done here uh, how can you support your position uh, reasons for the decision, logic behind the argument, benefits adapted to the audience. Again, all good good stuff to be thinking about in terms of a resume. Uh, if you say you're qualified, why are you qualified? You know, do you have any specific points you can mention? I, I love this last one, benefits adapted to the audience. So, so many students working on their resumes, they keep talking about me, me, me. And they'll say, I need this job because I could use the experience. Or I, I need this job because it would let me apply the skills I've learned. Now, that's very me-focused. 
what you want to focus on instead is what you can do for them. All right, so you want to emphasize maybe there's a, a some new software they that they're working on there, and you could talk about how the uh, how your experience would improve that software, give you maybe you could help train other people to use it. Let's see what aspects of the total situation may be relevant. So these are big picture <laughs> uh, big picture items. Uh, they've got here the economy. Well, this is, you know, I, I can't imagine a more important thing uh, than the economy when you're on the job market. Uh, if, you, if you happen to know that there's a lot of demand uh, for people doing your line of work, <laughs> that's pretty useful information. Uh, if, on the other hand, it's a poor economy and everybody's downsizing, uh, then you uh, might have a lot more trouble. Uh, time of year, uh, this is an interesting one. And so you could imagine seasonal considerations, right? Or maybe, uh, you know, with, with education, everything revolves around a school year. It'd be kind of weird to be looking for a teaching job sometime in, you know, the middle of uh, February. Uh, February. Uh, you'd want to be mindful of that. <laughs> the morale in the organization. So that would just, you know, are people happy there? Are they unhappy? Yeah, they'd probably be pretty good to know. Uh, you wouldn't want to go to work for a company where everybody's <laughs> down. <laughs> uh, relationship between the audience and the communicator. Uh, so are you a professor talking to a student, manager talking to a subordinate, and so on. Let's see, brainstorming. Several possible solutions for every communication problem. So. Uh, we talked about the the resumes. Of course, there's almost infinite ways you could you could write that resume. Uh, you don't necessarily need to know them all. You just need to be aware of the possibilities. Uh, see, first one you think of may not be the best. <laughs> uh, then again, sometimes you just need to trust your instincts. But uh, but yeah, um, you know what I find is that if I'm angry or really frustrated, uh, and I write out an email uh, it's usually better if i just delete that email and and call the per wait till i'm calm and then call the person or just maybe just not say anything about it and come back the next day <laughs> uh, because usually when you're kind of upset uh, you're not really thinking clearly and if you just you really regret it if you just send something off too quickly so sometimes it's better to let some time pass see measure solutions against the audiences and purposes. <clears throat> so measure the solutions against the audiences and purposes. So, uh, you know, I'm trying to think of what they might have had in, in mind here, but uh, it seems like they're saying, you're just kind of returning to that idea again, right? Of know your audience, know your purpose. Organizing to fit audiences, purposes, and context. Uh, yeah, here's some good solid material here. Uh, putting the good news first. Always a great strategy. <laughs> uh, it seems like no matter what you're emphasizing, uh, you notice the first of this lecture, we, we started off this PowerPoint talking about how good communicators earn more money, right? That's kind of good news. Uh, gives you a reason to want to pay attention. Uh, putting the main points and questions first. Or... Uh, if there's a reluctant audience, they say you can delay the main point or question. Uh, so when I think about reluctant audiences, you can imagine, uh, let's say you're addressing a, an audience of people that, you know, everybody, <laughs> maybe there's been a bunch of people laid off recently and uh, they're really reluctant to hear uh, your plan to maybe even lay more people off. So you'd really have to be careful how you couch that information. You'd want to follow these principles carefully, not just, you probably won't want to just blurt out the worst stuff right away. Uh, it might have a nasty result. All right, and then let's see, what, what did we have here? Uh, documents, make document visually inviting. Okay, yeah, so this for this one, let's think about an email. Uh, the subject line, is that part of the email where you say basically the, the purpose of the email. And a lot of students uh, just put something like, hey there, or need help, or um, problem, <laughs> or sometimes it's just blank, just flat out blank. And that's bad because I don't have any idea of, of 
what's in there. I don't know what to expect, and it's sort of confusing. I might actually maybe, maybe accidentally delete it, thinking it's spam even. Uh, so it's really nice to put a little bit of information in there. Uh, English 332 student needing help with resume. You know, that, that gives me a really good idea of what to expect uh, versus just help or hey. Uh, using headings to group related ideas. So you can see this throughout this PowerPoint, how they got the titles on the slides, make document visually inviting. And then under that are the, all these little headings we've been reading. And we can see this format kind of helps us to see how these ideas are related. Uh, also, of course, these are in the form of lists. Uh, they say you can number the items if order matters. So for this list, this, this, these bullets we're looking at on the slide, it could have been one, two, three, four, but it doesn't really matter about the order of these. We're kind of just bringing them out one at a time anyway, so it really doesn't need to have a numbered list. Uh, if, on the other hand, I had uh, five steps, it'd be pretty, pretty weird if I didn't number the steps. If I just said step, step, <laughs> that would be weird. I mean, it should be step one, step two, you get the idea. Uh, then we have a short paragraphs. Oh my God, so vital. Please here. <laughs> I'm gonna highlight this one. This is crucial. Short paragraphs. Uh, I know a lot of you maybe are used to different writing purposes. Maybe you're writing essays, or I don't know what it is. But in a business scenario, you never want to have these long, beefy paragraphs. I mean, I've seen. Uh, as, uh, I've seen documents where the, they're, they're writing like page long, just one big paragraph. It covers up the whole page <laughs> like a monster. And for God's sake, don't do that. Uh, I think six lines is probably too big for a max. I'd probably say more like four lines. Uh, but lots of short paragraphs with lots of headings and lists, that's almost always better than some kind of huge paragraph. Makes it really... As soon as you see that big monster paragraph, you just want to die <laughs> or fall asleep. <laughs> okay, uh, positive style, emphasizing positive information, giving it more space. Yeah. Uh, intended lists to set it off. You know, this is one of the key things with, the, again, coming back to the resumes and the job letters. Uh, sometimes less is more with this stuff, and, but sometimes more is more. You know, again, if you've been in the... If you've been in the Army or the Navy or, or you're the captain of the football team, uh, something like that, uh, you, you want to really make sure that that's given its due emphasis. So, you know, spend, if you want to spend two or three extra lines talking about it, great. Uh, maybe you want to indent it off. Sometimes uh, you'll notice this point. If you're getting a promotion, let's say, <laughs> You, uh, congratulations, you've been promoted. Uh, you might want to have a, just a little indented list following that uh, that lists off the benefits of your promotion, right? And maybe one of the points is an increase in pay of such and such. Uh, you get your own parking space. <laughs> you get uh, access to the company car. I mean, it'd be a great, great stuff there for your indented list. It's really emphasizing that positive. Uh, omit negative words if you can. So some people are addicted to not, and instead of saying happy, they'll say, well, I'm not sad. <laughs> uh, I don't know if that's quite what they mean there, but uh, you could think of all kinds of negative words. Abomination, uh, terrible, tragedy. Uh, you know, it, <laughs> you're tr remember, you're trying to create a positive message here, so you don't want to muddy that with negative words. Uh, focusing on possibilities, not limitations. And this is one I think we could all benefit from thinking more about, right? You know, if you, you know, no job place is ever perfect. You never have all the resources you want. Uh, you never have the perfect coworkers and, and so on. But if you really just focus on possibilities, you know, what can you get done? You know, what, what can you achieve? You know, that's better to focus on that than just keep harping on, uh, stuff that you can't change or can't affect. Um, it's just, not only is it not positive, it's really just not helpful. All right, editing the draft. I do think, yeah, we got one slide after this one, so <laughs> hang in there, almost done. Uh, I was hoping this wouldn't go on for this long, but uh, 
It's actually quite a bit of information in this first chapter. Uh, so editing the draft, they're talking here about double checking, some details. One, the reader's name. Uh, again, think about that letter to the, uh, the, the job application letter, or the, that email to this person and you got the name wrong. <laughs> it's bad. And sometimes this can happen, by the way, when you're sending out a whole bunch of letters. And I've seen even graduate students, they'll come in and they'll say, uh, hey, Matt, I, I'm writing these letters to uh, these different universities and I'm trying to get into the program. And I'll look at the letter and I'll say, where's this one to? And they'll say, well, that one's supposed to go to Texas Tech. And I say, look, but you got uh, <laughs> U of M on there. Whoa, you know, I, I totally forgot that was there. So definitely worth double checking that. Uh, numbers, again, we, we talked about the dangers you can get into about that. Even the phone number. If you get, Imagine putting the wrong phone number now. Uh, first and last paragraphs. Uh, this is, not only is this true in business writing, but essays in general, I always tell students, even in 191, take an extra minute, make sure that introduction's good, look at the conclusion, make sure that's good, uh, because that's your first impression. You know how important that is. Uh, but also that last impression, kind of lasting impression, right? Uh, so those are the two spots you really want to make sure are as close to perfect as you can get them, because uh, you can just, you know, even if everything else is perfect, if you start off bad and, or in bad <laughs> or start and end badly, you know, of course, they're going to forget the good stuff that was in the middle. So it's a very good list. Uh, checking spelling, grammar, punctuation. Uh, this is easier said than done, right? I mean, usually if you have a spelling error, it's because you don't know the correct spelling. Uh, fortunately, it will usually uh, underline the word, so you can go and check it that way. Grammar and punctuation is really, really tough. You know, I've been teaching writing for 10 plus years. I've written six, seven books. <laughs> you know, I'm probably as close to expert as you can get in, in writing and grammar and punctuation. But even I will make mistakes. And it, so I've seen all my books. They've gone through editing, proofreading, and all that. And yet there'll be little errors here and there. It's just really hard to catch them all. And believe me, I'll catch hundreds, but some of them will still, I still don't do quite a good enough job because some of them will still slip through. So uh, that's coming from a basically uh, you know, a professional. I'm not trying to brag on myself, just just saying uh, as a professional, I struggle with this. So if you're just starting out, you know, you really need to uh, double, triple, quadruple check. Yes, and always proofread before sending. So crucial. I don't know how many times I've gotten to the habit of this. The hard, I've learned this the hard way. You know, if it's an important email, don't just write and send. Don't just, you know, don't send that thing. Uh, just let it, you know, go get a glass of water. Go uh, walk around. Uh, just do something and then come back and proofread it just to make sure it's something that everything's correct in there, that you've got everything done. You know, especially if you're mass emailing. I mean, oh, God, so embarrassing when you are sending out an announcement and everybody's going to see this in your company. And, yeah, it's happened to me. <laughs> and you, you didn't proofread it and there's some errors in there and then everybody's going to judge you on those errors. I mean, you don't want to get paranoid about it, uh, but it, you do want to be par paranoid enough to at least proofread it. All right, so this is the final slide. Thank you for bearing with me. It's almost an, an hour long. Sorry. <laughs> Hopefully it hasn't been too painful. Um, so they're, they're talking here about that idea of responding to the message. And, you know, if they're formal, uh, you can you need to be formal back. If, if they're informal, though, maybe you could be informal. But they're getting in a little more detail there. So they say, evaluate your feedback. So... You know, maybe the student writes me back and, and says, I, I can't find the calendar or I couldn't find this link. Uh, you sent the link. The link didn't work. So, you know, I need to find out, well, what's what's happening there? Uh, so that would be in the case of a failure. But what's often forgotten, though, is if it succeeded, then I can find out why it succeeded. So I, I also apply this to reviews. Uh, so sometimes, well, I guess uh, every time. I've written a book, I've gotten reviews of that book 
posted, published on Amazon. And some of those people say, I love the book. <laughs> it's a great book, and blah, blah, blah. Uh, but other people, they, they think it's the most terrible garbage they've ever read. And usually I just say, well, the, <laughs> the person that hated the book, <laughs> that must just be an idiot, right? Uh, why even read that review? But that makes me, I'm the idiot, really, if I do that. Uh, so what do you want to do is find out, well, why did that person that liked the book like it? Maybe I can do more of that. Uh, the person that didn't like the book, can I figure out what their problem was? Uh, maybe they maybe they didn't like it because they, uh, you know, their copy was damaged and or they uh, got the wrong book. Uh, <laughs> who knows? It would be very nice if I could figure out why and evaluate that feedback properly. Yeah, success equals results you want when you want them. All right, folks, uh, I think we'll end it here. It's been almost uh, 55 minutes according to uh, my timer there, so I'll just quickly end it. Uh, I will say, though, if you had any questions, comments along the way, please chime in, and I'll see you again soon. Thank you for watching.